Hi, welcome back to another Parentscapes video. This video is the wrap up of the uh, Orc Display Board project. Before I get to that, I just want to uh, welcome any new viewers and subscribers. And I suspect uh, there, there may be some people where this is the only video they see of the ORC project. Uh, but if you are curious, there are other videos in the playlist, a whole bunch, 20 plus videos on this project. So if you are interested, you can go check those out. And if somehow I uh, seduce you into becoming a patron, uh, there are on my Patreon account. where you can see some more uh, behind the scenes uh, in progress uh, work that I did on this project. So, but either way, even if this is only stop on my channel, I really appreciate your visit and I hope that you uh, find some interesting or entertaining about this video. Before we continue too much further, we need to talk about the cocktail. Today's cocktail is a Black Russian. Uh, hold on. Uh, Black Russian is uh, equal parts Kahlua and vodka, and I'm a pretty big Kahlua fan. I love that coffee flavor, and I got a little bit of a sweet tooth subsided. Some, some sometimes I feel like it's still a little too strong on the Kahlua. So this time I added about uh, one and a half ounces of vodka to one ounce of Kahlua, and I think if I had my druthers uh, for the next one, I might go with a two to one vodka Kahlua just to take some of that sweet down off of the back side of it. And I have uh, my crystal clear ice in here. And I tried to take a photo, which will appear somewhere, maybe over here, to show you what that might look like up close. So I rushed the photo, so I don't know I'm doing it justice, but at least it gives you a little bit of idea about what it looks like. Uh, but of course, those big, chunky, irregular cubes floating around in this drink, and it's dark, so they add like a little bright spot in it. I think it's nice. I like it quite a bit. But you did not come here to listen to me talk about cocktails. You came here to talk about, you're not talking about anything. Well, maybe you are in the background. I can't see through the lens, uh, people of the future who are watching this. You're here to hear me talk about the Orc Board Display Project. And uh, just before we jump over to take a look at it, this is the final video of this project. And it has been a long journey to get here. And it has been a, a crawl, an absolute crawl to get this final video shot and to get all of this stuff wrapped up. I feel like I've been avoiding it. I, I mean, I'm not. But then all of a sudden, I'm easy. it's easy for me to find something else to, to do when I should be getting this done. And I wondered if it's some kind of uh, like an emotional block or something. When I have put in so much time into a project. Uh, I've lived with it for so long. And I think when it's ready to leave, I'm always nervous about releasing my baby into the world, kind of. Now it's like people will actually see it in person. I'm nervous about what the next project is going to be. I don't, I mean, I know what it is, but how am I going to handle it? I don't always feel like I handle projects the best. There's probably something else mixed in there. So I don't know. It's It's been a bit of a, of a struggle to get this final video out. And I uh, have had this place in an absolute disaster for the last two weeks. I've got the files all over the place. I've been trying to organize them so I don't lose them because I shot, you know, three videos without doing any posting of any of them. And I haven't edited them yet. Just feels weird. And I don't think I recognized this before with some of the other projects, but I think it's always there uh, when I wrap them up. So it's an interesting reflection moment for me. And just before we go over to the uh, bench, it's not on the regular bench. Uh, I just want to um, send out a thank you to the client. Um, the client for this project has been super patient. <laughs> you need to be with me, I think. And super enthusiastic about all the things that I've been doing. And that is um, a wonderful exchange for me to have with a client. And I also want to thank my patrons because they are helping financially when I am 
going too far on a project. I've overextended myself and that support makes a real difference. They're also uh, supporting me with encouragement and with suggestions and feedback. And I really appreciate that. And I think uh, I also want to thank them for providing a shoulder for me to kind of lean on when I'm feeling a little down. And they uh, probably don't even know that their shoulder has my head resting on it. Uh, but sometimes it is. And it means a lot to me. And I also want to extend a huge thank you uh, to my wife. Uh, she is a block of stone. And I seem unable to chip away at it despite my my best effort sometimes. And it's just uh, fantastic to have somebody like that in your corner rooting for you and uh, helping you along the way. So just wanted to thank you for this So without further ado, let's take a look at this board. I should start off by saying that all of the elements that you see on this board have individual uh, videos for them specifically. So you can see those videos if you want to get more details on each of these pieces. But uh, I'd like to start off with the frame. And the frame, the front edge, I actually routed on the wrong side. The routed edge was supposed to be on the inside. Uh, but I think it looks better from the front, actually. But it did mean that along the corners of the board, the routed edge does not meet properly. And in fact, it's a little bit worse than that because I didn't miter the corners. So I had to put a little patch in on the back there. And it's not something I'm happy with by any measure, but from front viewing, it's not quite as viewable as, as it, you might think. And so I got kind of lucky in that regard. I contoured the back of this board as well as over the cliff edges uh, to match that transition. And Tanya gave me that suggestion, and it was just a fantastic idea. Uh, it really helped bring the frame into the board as a, a sort of a seamless element. And I wouldn't have thought of that on my own. And uh, you can see in the back here that I also uh, did that for the back edge because there is a transition as the uh, land descends to uh, meet the hut. And so uh, that was a really nice uh, way to bridge those uh, different heights. Color of the frame, I was hoping it would be just a little bit lighter than it came out. The wood that I used had the staining from my from sanding off the uh, finish. Uh, this was a reclaimed IKEA bed uh, frame. The finish hid a little bit of that uh, stain effect, but you can see here that some areas the stain effect came through, and it depends on the lighting and certain areas. Uh, there were definitely problems with the frame. This routed edge is an abomination, and I'm really sad about how that came out. And I definitely had some problems with the way I finished the board. There are some blemishes and some areas that weren't really sanded well. So uh, it's not perfect, but I think overall the frame did come out well. So I'm mostly pleased, barring some of those small issues I had, like the, the routing and the corners. Taking a look at the cliff colors, uh, I ended up pushing them. Uh, quite back towards gray, although a lot of the blue is preserved. And I think it gives it a much more natural look that uh, made me feel a little bit more comfortable about that blue color. Uh, but uh, it still retained enough of that blue to give it a very distinctive look. One thing I ended up uh, not doing was redoing the pearl effect over the stone. I was surprised that even though I didn't uh, reapply the, the pearl finish over it, you can still see it in some of the areas coming through. So that was kind of a nice surprise. Uh, I ended up not doing the pearl uh, over again because I had spent so much time on the cliff. At, at some point, I had to just say uh, enough is enough working on the cliff. Now, looking at the talus along the edge, there's a, a problem with it in the sense that there isn't scattered bits carrying out in front of it. And uh, normally, talus would have, you know, a debris pile uh, moving away from it as it got thinner and thinner. And uh, I ended up not doing that because of the way I had built the cliff. Uh, the cliff's construction um, had the talus basically attached right to it. And when I was finishing it, I had to place it on the board uh, repeatedly to test fit to do some of the work on the actual painting of the board. And so because I had a contour underneath 
the cliff, it meant that I had to fit it in repeatedly. And because these bottom talus pieces are actually cast in plaster, the plaster pieces would have been chipping uh, really regularly as I flipped it over and then flipped it back again. And there would have been really no easy way for me to make a bridge between these two unless I put in bits on the board and uh, painted them at the same time of the cliff. And I'm sure that they would have been damaged uh, because I was moving it around. And of course, you know me, I've always said with talus piles that you should have material sticking away from it, uh, you know, sort of cascading away from it, in smaller and smaller pieces. And obviously I didn't do that here. So it was a compromise really that I made uh, between the finished look and the actual method of construction. And here you see the large tree. And I constructed the large tree basically very similar uh, to the smaller trees, which I showed in an earlier video. And one of the things I did a little differently is I added in some birds, some uh, crows or ravens, as well as a vulture on the tree to give it a little bit uh, more distinction, bring some more interest to it. Uh, and I think uh, that I was unaware when I was originally building the tree that they're actually a little hard to see uh, or to find because of the dense foliage. And so, you know, they're scattered around on the tree. And I think one of the other things that makes them hard to see is that there's so many bright elements on the board that really catch the eye. And those bright elements, you know, they're very hot visually. You're going to want to look at those more. And I think that means that people won't be looking at the tree quite as closely as maybe some other areas. So it kind of makes those uh, birds a little bit of an Easter egg, something that the careful observer might find and be a little surprised at seeing. So originally, the heights of these various elements, particularly the idol and the tree, were planned to be much larger. Uh, and the hut actually was planned to be much smaller. And I had planned the idol and the tree to be a balancing elements to balance the height of, say, the lobbers that are going to be in the corner of the board and the uh, overall cliff size, uh, and as well as the hut. But here the hut got much, much larger and the idol got much, much smaller and the tree got smaller as well. And so it changed the overall balance of the board. But I still think it works because the tree really still adds some transitional height uh, to the back of the board. And and that was something I was really looking for. And of course, the uh, elevator. So, you know, the trees tucked a little bit in the back here in this little nook. And I still think it's effective at helping to bridge that. You can kind of see that here, uh, bridging the overall height. And the elevator contributes to that as well uh, as a sort of uh, transitional element to bring the eye up to the top of the board and to give a little more uh, balance as we make the transition to the hut. Uh, so it worked. Uh, if I had made the tree much larger, I think I would have been crazy as the wire armature tree was uh, quite a bit of work to create and uh, making it much larger would have made it a, a tremendous task. And here you can see an example of the plant clumps that are scattered around on the board. And remember that there are videos that cover all of these elements in more detail. And so if you have questions, you could check those out. And here we see the sacrificial tree with um, various elements comprised of bits from the giant kit and some uh, orc uh, kits and the uh, arachnorok uh, kit and the hobbit was a donation and it was just something that i put together to be a little whimsical something to complement the altar and increase that sort of worship feel uh, and to the board and i think that was pretty effective and here we see the altar and this evolved a little bit over time with the snotling being added pretty much right at the end. And I worked hard um, with all these elements to paint them to match the uh, client's models. And you can see, I think I did a fair job uh, with his orc shaman uh, in the back there. And this is the idol. And the idol uh, comprises of the idol itself, of course. And then uh, he is standing on a turn counter that rotates. Uh, the idol was sculpted entirely from Sculpey with a few orc bits added in and chain and those sort of elements. Of course, the mask as well. And uh, I worked fairly hard to try to add as many bits as I could to give it an orky feel, uh, but still retain the wooden construction look of it. And the uh, turn counter is comprised of 
the various uh, moons and as the moons get larger uh, you advance in your turns and so the smallest moon would be turn one and the largest moon would be turn six and this is the hut and the elevator so you can kind of see them as a pair and the elevator is comprised of the two winches at the bottom powered by snotlings and then the crane itself and the lifting platform filled with uh, loot presumably and then of course the hut uh, which is the dominant piece I think on the board visually and the crane has a block and tackle that's all um, actually functional if the ropes weren't glued in uh, so to speak uh, with a ramp coming off of the back and um, stairs approaching it and this is the uh, winches and the snotlings were all uh, carefully drilled out in their hands to actually hold on to the bars and the ropes and the tree trunks that it's being wrapped around were sculpted uh, with the rope um, doing a really nice job of kind of tying everything, everything together, literally. Uh, but visually, it helps to bridge everything. And the rope, I was very pleased with. Uh, it's siren ship uh, modeling rope. And you can see the video for more on that. And the elevator, I think represents a good transition uh, from the bottom uh, to the upper cliff and the hut here was designed with the walkway to have the orc boss looking out over his troops uh, so to speak and so the client was nice enough to send me a model a few models to help guide me in the painting and planning and so uh, I had to put him up there to kind of emphasize that point point. and this is the banner that I uh, freehand painted. It was my first attempt really at freehand painting, luckily a simple symbol, but uh, I really liked how the banner came out. Nice compliment to the walkway. And this is the rear of the hut, the actual entrance to it. And I wanted it sort of adorned with um, loot and, and food. And of course, guarded by a pair of snotlings, brave stalwarts that they are. Uh, and I think uh, it's a, a, a really nice piece of the hut that uh, you'll have to come around to the back of the board to see so maybe perhaps another easter egg uh, that uh, i hope people will see since it took uh, quite a bit of time to actually put the whole rear of the entrance together and here you can see what the board looks like in dim light i have a small light on uh, over my shoulder and kind of see me moving around there uh, to show the shadow effect uh, and i wanted to give you a pullback view and here we can see the cave in the dark and i think this is where it really shines so to speak uh, the webs give you a really nice uh, visual cue so that you can see the contour of the cave the depth of the cave and the mushrooms you know really come through vibrantly and uh, draw your eye into the cave and i really liked how they came out i think it's a a nice variety of the mushrooms and uh, one of my patrons suggested that I reduce the number that I originally had and I think that was a very good suggestion so I feel a lot more comfortable about the number of uh, uh, mushrooms that are in there and in these photos you can see they're just a little bit overexposed uh, so that you can see the detail a little bit easier uh, and so it's a little brighter than you would see in real uh, if you were viewing it in person but uh, I really liked how the web came out. Uh, it's more in, aligned with uh, the, uh, the genus of spiders. This is a little, little geeky moment here of um, Latrodectris. And those are the uh, black widows uh, are a member of that. And they create a very irregular web when, the, when they spin. And so I thought this gives a little plausibility to the, the shape of the webs that I have in there. And that made me, um, feel a little bit better about their overall appearance in terms of realism and here we can see the idol and it really gives uh, the sort of best effect for that glowing face and what i liked about it is it really highlights the mouth uh, when the light is dim and it gives him a real bestial look which i think works out really really well it also emphasizes the idol uh, over the uh, turn counter base which is nice because uh, it's quite busy visually and here it really draws your eye directly to the idol and gives a, a sort of sense of the power of magic that is fueling his uh, uh, presence for the worshipers and here you see the hut and its lighting effect and it comes through really well when the room lights are turned off uh, and it was one of the particular challenges of lighting the board in that if the hut lights are 
bright enough to see easily when the room lights are on, it's going to look like there's an inferno inside the hut. And if it's uh, properly lit when the lights are off, it's very difficult to see the flames when the room lights are on, which is probably how most people are going to view it. Uh, so it was something that I tried to balance. Now inside the hut, the LED array, there are several bulbs, are uh, have several different rates of flickering. And the uh, flickering rate varies because you are emulating a fire as opposed to a single flame. So I ended up using a variety of flickering bulbs at various rates to create this effect. And one of the other things I did is that I added a diffuser to the fire uh, over the uh, LEDs and to prevent you when you look in the side of the K of the hut like this that you would be able to see the LED array and it would spread the light a little bit more evenly as well and unfortunately one of the things that that did is it really reduced the appearance of the flickering. Now it actually shows a little bit better in the, the video than it does in person, and it's much more observable when the lights are off, but it is not as predominant as I wished it had been when the lights are on, uh, because it, and I think part of the problem with balancing the light of the hut is that it's very nuanced because it has to work in two different lighting environments, and it's not something I can push too far in either direction as opposed to the idle, let's say, where I can really just blast as much light out of his face as I want. And I want to just give you a sense of the, uh, the switch that I have installed. The switch has a LED that indicates when it is on. And uh, I really thought it was kind of a nice touch, if I may say so myself. And you can see um, it's just kind of being fun here, a little dramatic uh, indication of it. And interesting for the idol, because of the capacitors that are powering the uh, effect of his glow, uh, when you turn it on or off, there's a little bit of a charge time for him to come up to speed, so to speak. Uh, and this is the electronics uh, that run the uh, board. And what I did is I installed a plug that could be plugged into the wall. These are held in with uh, Velcro. And when you pull out the plug, uh, you are still able to put the door back on uh, so that you can preserve that look. And I thought that came out uh, pretty nicely, actually. And I've never done that before, installing a plug. And so um, this was uh, uh, a nice first attempt. And you can see the door is held in by magnets, uh, rare earth magnets. And when you're done with the plug, you just have to kind of just jam all the cords in there, but it's it's safe to do so. Um, all the other electronics are tied off or or secured well, so it's not going to get tangled in anything. And I also installed a battery option so that you could power it remotely if you didn't have access to a plug. And you'll notice here that I've put in indicators uh, for the polarity of the batteries, and that is important because uh, they are run in parallel, which is more unusual uh, than the normal series uh, where they're oppositely uh, installed. But once you have the batteries installed, uh, then you can just place them inside. Again, there's Velcro to hold that, and then you can just cover them up with the door. Now, the batteries that I am using are lithium ion batteries, and these batteries, it comes with a charger, and I have two sets because the batteries were labeled as 3600 milliamp hours. I knew they weren't. Uh, that is far, far beyond the milliamp hour range of any even outstanding lithium ion. These are 18650s. Uh, and so they actually came in much, much lower than I expected, about 1200 ma. And so I contacted the company and I actually uh, complained to them and they uh, sent me a second pair. Now it's important uh, that the batteries be installed properly. Uh, so I created a little, uh, uh, you know, tag on the inside of the panel to uh, give you all the basic instructions. These are common uh, listings on lithium ion battery installation. Uh, so I stole uh, some of this, but I also added in um, a piece on the short circuiting. And you will short circuit the batteries if you installed them as a series where the polarities are opposite, which is why I put in the extra large indicators for how they should be installed. Um, when lithium batteries are short-circuited, they can overheat and they can 
light on fire, or they can explode. So it's uh, pretty important that you pay attention. Uh, it's not something that happens immediately. And in fact, I had installed them uh, improperly once myself before I put in the extra big labels. And um, all of a sudden I noticed that they were heating up and I quickly removed them. Uh, so I actually should have added at the top of this uh, a tag that says caution lithium ion batteries uh, so uh, that you would know exactly what kind of batteries you're using. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I wanted to include this as a little extra and, uh, and I should have put in a limiter uh, a short circuit protector into this, but I am relatively new to the electronic world, as I've said before. So uh, I did not do that. I should add very, very quickly that the lighting system is powered by a buck boost converter, which is um, setting a constant six volt output for all of the lights on the board. Now, I also uh, didn't know that the buck boost converter causes a trickle discharge on the batteries. Even when it's turned off, if I had installed it at a different point in the circuit, that wouldn't have happened. When you were done, uh, using the batteries, uh, they should be removed. Otherwise, they will continue to discharge very slowly, but over a day or two, they will be drained, and that's just damaging to the batteries. No danger, but it, it will uh, damage the battery's ability to hold the charge. And this was uh, how I was planning the arrangement of the elements and the models that would accompany, uh, that would be placed on the board. And the of course, the, the models can be arranged in any fashion, uh, but this was how I envisioned the models being displayed uh, that the client was referencing would be the army that would be placed on this board. And all of the elements I created are basically in the place that you see on this map. So the this map is still valid. This was early in the planning stage. Uh, one thing that I did move was the sacrificial tree. And I took the tree and I decided to move it a little more forward uh, to this spot here since I liked the tree and I felt like it needed to be more easily viewed than tucked way in the back corner. Uh, so this is a guide for the client, not a not a rule, of course, and mo more models can be added and uh, the arrangement can be changed very easily. And I wanted as a final look to give you a sense of how some of the elements look from above and how they're arranged uh, in terms of spacing, density. And I'm very happy overall with how the uh, board looks from above in terms of the arrangement of the elements and uh, how they give a nice fill for the board, but still allow a lot of flexibility for the client to be able to put models, new models on various areas of the board. So hopefully you enjoyed taking a look at the board. Uh, it is not the largest project I've done by any means in terms of just raw size but it has been by far the most complicated, the most detailed, been such a diverse project for me. And uh, that has been wonderful because uh, it's really broadened my palette of skills and tools that I can bring to future projects. Uh, so it has been rewarding in that sense. I am pleased with how it came out. There are, of course, there are things that I would like to change, uh, but I think my favorite piece I'm looking over at it right now. I think my favorite piece is the elevator. It doesn't have any lights. I didn't sculpt it from scratch. I don't know. With the ropes and the, the angles and the snotlings on the winches. And it feels, I think, the most narrative of all the pieces on the board. And perhaps that's why I like it so much. Uh, but it's definitely my favorite spot. I realized I forgot to do viewer comments. And uh, so I've stepped away from the camera and I just came back before I put everything away. And uh, man, it is humid. I've been doing some work in the basement. So if I look a little uh, a little damp, uh, that's why. I need a makeup person. Makeup! Viewer comments. AJ Finch, a hobby guy Mitch, Ratnat Miniatures, Chris Watkins, Josh Foreman, and 181920, 1819. Interesting name. All said that they enjoy the cocktail segment of the videos. And uh, that made me very happy. I'm enjoying it too. Eventually, this is going to take me into some darker corners of cocktails uh, once I kind of get through the most uh, sort of, you know, common ones, like a Black Russian. We'll explore it together. Uh, and I just want to uh, thank them for that comment. And Maximilian Roof uh, asked me, how do I ship fragile items? Uh, 
think and he referenced um, like the board and other things that have little details that are fragile. Uh, the hut comes to mind as I look over at the board. What would I be most afraid of shipping? It's probably going to be the hut. So the board itself is uh, going to go into a crate. In fact, everything will. Then inside of that crate, I will put in the uh, board and I will pack it um, with materials that won't settle in such a way that it could shift. So um, in order to keep things from shifting, you either have to pack it full of packing materials or you have to use things that won't shift on their own, like um, air pack, air bu you know, bubble, air bubble pack. It's called air pack. For the, I'll be packing them individually in boxes and then putting those in the crate. The thing about fragility, the heavier an object is, the more fragile it becomes. Because when you, when you jar, science, here we go, science, science lesson. When you um, jar an object, all right, the is the mass times its acceleration, right? This is its inertia. And the, the higher the mass, right, the more that multiplier is. And then it becomes also the size of the, of the area that is struck, uh, which is pressure, which is why a woman's high heeled shoe exerts like 15 tons of force or something like that on every little, because it's just a little tiny spot holding up a whole woman, right? So, excuse me, it's hot. For the object, the tree stands, those are fine. I mean, I can just gently pack them in some foam peanuts and they're not going to move. They're super light um, and they're strong enough to take it. For something like the hut with all of those, you know, doodads sticking out everywhere um, and the, the banner in particular, what the hell am I going to do with that? I think I'm going to probably um, use some of that sofa foam in certain places to fill that void so that um, uh, peanuts will be putting pressure, you know, from, from the force, will be putting pressure more on the foam than on those points. And then I'm just gonna pack it with peanuts uh, because I'm sure uh, the, uh, the crate should not be turned over so it won't be inverted. And to be honest, um, you know, because it's only gonna go side to side and it's not getting like thrown in a truck by UPS driver or whatever, not be smirking any UPS drivers, but you know what I mean? So these things will ship pretty safely uh, with that system. Elevator is easy. The idle eh, requires a little more, you know, a little more careful packing, but uh, overall it will be fine. So when you're packing your own items that are very fragile, in fact, one of my patrons was just asking me about shipping a Hearst Arts project that he's working on. Those are super difficult because they're very heavy and they have a lot of fragile unions. I broke several pieces when I was making her starts uh, uh, buildings because of that factor. So what we were discussing was maybe um, lining the, the object, uh, the, the, the model with uh, saran wrap. This was my idea, it is untested. Test on a small piece first, please. Um, and then filling it with um, expanding foam, like you could just get a couple cans of gap filler. It's all on my Patreon. Actually, I think that's publicly viewable. So if you go to my Patreon page and you go to community posts and you scroll down, you probably will find that discussion. So I won't go into it here in much detail. In any case, the object there is to prevent any movement, to really lock it in place. Um, I still don't think that's a guarantee. Some testing should be done. Uh, to know, but that was my idea. So that's a really extreme example, but things like Hearst Arts buildings are really difficult to ship unless they're a super basic structure, you know? Um, so, so it kind of depends on the object um, and it depends on how I'm shipping them. Hopefully that helps you a little bit with your shipping woes. Good luck, pack well, and uh, here the rest of the video will now continue. I just want to remind you that if you'd like to become a patron, it would be more appreciated than you can imagine. Do you want to see um, extra tidbits behind the scenes? You want to post your work and you want to get my feedback on it, as well as some of the other members of the patron community. If that's something you're interested in, uh, of course, you can um, go to the card up here or follow the link in the description and your support is always appreciated. On my way out, I guess I'm on my way out of this video, right? Does that count? You may be wondering what's coming up next.
I will tell you in the next video. Here's my, there's my, my rod and reel, right? I got you hooked and I'm going to reel you into the next video. So, uh, I hope you do come back for that next video because you know that I will be back soon. Terrence video.